Uh, it's a joy to get to preach God's Word. I'm thankful to be uh, here today with you by God's providence to continue in this sermon series through the letters of John. We're in 1 John chapter 2 this morning. If you want to grab your Bibles and turn there with me. If you're just becoming familiar with Holy Scripture, it's in the very back of your Bible. And you'll find it just after 2 Peter and just before the last two uh, books of Jude and Revelation. It's way back. 1 John chapter 2. Today, it's my privilege to preach verse 7 and 8 in a sermon that I've titled, An Old and New Commandment. It's a really clever title. It's, it just took a long time to think about it. God's Word is good. Amen. So we come hungry, we come ready to, to, uh, to understand, to grow in our knowledge of Him. Humble and ready to be shaped, convicted, moved by Him for His glory, for our good. Look with me at verse 7 and 8. John says, Beloved, I am writing you no new covenant, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Many English translations start verse 7 with the words, Dear friends, maybe your Bible says that. I believe this translation is insufficient because it misses the depth of the connection and affection that John has or aims to convey to his blood-bought brothers and sisters in Christ. The Greek word that we see here is, is the word we see before us in our ESV translation that I like to preach out of is the word beloved. John's writing not just to dear friends or even close family, but those who are loved by God. They are His beloved. The use of this term communicates not only a heartfelt closeness to others, but deep gratefulness for the unity that they have being recipients of God's divine grace and love. Listen to Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 1, 4 through 6. He says, Even as he, speaking of God the Father, chose us in him, speaking of Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. This is basically highlighting the great news that we who are the Beloved, the Beloved of God, those who, who God has loved from before time, those who are saved and adopted in Christ, <clears throat> we are the recipients of the grace that blesses us beyond all measure. And this is done in the capital B, Beloved. That is, of Jesus. And this is huge. I want you to think about it with me. The one whom God the Father has loved for all eternity past, His beloved Son, Jesus, is the one whom He gives up so that we who are His chosen people, whom He has loved from eternity past, according to Holy Scripture, can be ransomed, can be adopted into His eternal blessings and His holy presence. The beloved are the beloved because we are beloved by God. This united affection of belonging is huge. It's a huge part of our affection and belonging for each other. What we have together is the church. John addresses his readers as my beloved six times in this letter alone. So it's on his mind. It's on his heart. It really means something special to him. And I just slow this morning to ask you, what does it mean to you? 
It's not a throwaway here. It truly sets up the very focal point of what John wants his beloved to see and to know and to do in the next phase of this letter. That we would love one another. So here and in the coming verses, John is turning from a a moral litmus test, essentially to a social one. True Christians will obey the commands of God. This is what we've seen in our recent study of this letter so far. True Christians will also love others like Christ because of Christ. This is what we're about to focus on today and in the coming weeks. Look with me. Verse 7, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. John does not explicitly express which commandment he's referring to, but in the context of the letter, it helps us to see what he's referencing, especially as we look to our passage next week in verse 9 through 11, as its focus is on loving others, loving one another. It's old, this commandment's old, in that it is central in the formal moral commandments of God that go all the way back to Moses. But we could really say it's older than that, it's ancient in that it points to the perfect, eternal attribute of God, that God is love. John is going to say it's old, and then he's going to say it's new. Right? You casually read this text we're in today and go, what is going on here? He's not contradicting himself, though. And he's not confused. I want you to see that by first saying that it's old, He is intentionally grounding his instruction in the ancient or in the long-standing as this is a way of establishing what is authoritative and foundational. This is not a concept that's far from us as a church by God's grace, the work that he's done in and through us, uh, especially over the last 13 years of much of our Reformation um, we're, uh, if, you, if you're new or visiting, we're the first Baptist church of Bakersfield. We're in our 133rd year of ministry here in Bakersfield, um, going back to 1889. Uh, we were historically an American Baptist church in the more liberal end of the Baptist practice, and by God's providence and gathering leaders and moving us to what is more biblical, what is more historic. Uh, Last 13 years, there's been great reformation in our historic church to move away from much of our more man-made traditions and practices, away from the American Baptist um, beliefs and practices towards a much more Reformed Baptist belief and practice. The word Reformed essentially just means committed to what is biblical. That we really don't want man-made tradition. We really don't want our own preferences. We just want to be a people, a church that is based on what's biblical and constantly reforming in whatever way that is. And what a joy it's been to have many join our congregation in the recent years and come to have reformation in your own lives. Maybe being a part of the church for a long time and just not even really realizing that you were part of something that wasn't super biblical you loved the people you ran with and the things that God did by His grace, and yet um, there is a conviction to be part of something that is just truly committed to Scripture in every way, and that's our hope, our longing. As we've been committed to a reformation according to the Word, what's been amazing is that we have seen that what we see in Scripture is also what's agreed upon upon the, the Orthodox Christian faith of old, the the confessions of old agree on the historic tenets of the Christian faith. And to get to see what we're seeing is, is what's there and have that affirmed is just a really sweet blessing. And so that's really much of what John's doing here. He's just trying to ground, hey, what I'm trying to press you in, what is being highlighted as new, is not new. It's grounded in something very old, very long-standing, very worthy of our faithfulness. 
It's often new to you and me as we study Scripture, right? As, as new layers of God's truths unfold, we go, wow, this is exciting. This is uh, uh, One of my favorite things is for people to say, like, I feel like I know God in a way I never have. Not because someone showed you around a corner like that, that they came up with. No, just because just you're seeing Him according to His Word in a new and fresh way, in a deeper way. What's often new to you and me, though, as we dive deep into God's Word, is old and long-standing. It's the long-standing truths of the Christian faith. Therefore, it's not new at all. And I praise God for protecting us and grounding us in God's Word in a way that we're not wandering off into man-made preferences or traditions or ideologies. May that continue to be this, the case. May you continue to hold your shepherds accountable to leading, teaching, loving you according to His Word. Nothing else. We need to never forget, church, the historic, long-standing truths and works of God. David, King David said this in Psalm 105.5, Remember the wondrous works that He has done. His miracles and the judgments He uttered. It's good for us to remember. Sat with some people in some hard stuff lately. Where life's taken some hard turns. And there's that temptation of the flesh to say, why? What, what is this? And one of the things that's a great blessing is, is to get back into the Word. To remember the most faithful suffered greatly. Lost much. As they lived by faith for Him and not according to their flesh or the ways of the world. We need those reminders. We need to remember 1 John 2, 7. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that, you've, that you have heard. You've heard this from the beginning, he's saying. John is going to continue to make this point throughout this letter and the next. And in this, he intends to point to what believers have heard from the beginning of their faith. You're outside of Christ. You're not walking with God. He illuminates you your soul to give you new birth to give you eyes to see and ears to hear and the truths of God just wash over you and the, the, they're so contrary to the ways of the world and, and the ways of God are just so fresh and so now this gospel truth's at work John's going to say this in 1 John chapter 2 24 let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you Later in 1 John chapter 3.11, we're going to see him say, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then his, his second letter, 2 John verse 6, This is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. So see his important Repetition, driving home this point. We see it today for the first time. John's point when he says, you have heard it from the beginning, is to highlight that love for one another is a central gospel reality. It's a gospel message that they've understood since they've trusted the gospel. Turn from their sin to trust their lives to Jesus and we're saved. So, in the context, I don't want you to miss this. John is saying, this is not a new innovation or rule to follow. And he's saying it like this. Sometimes you look at Scripture and you go, why is he talking this way that seems so contradictory? Remember the context, church. He, there are many false teachers who are promoting man-made ideas and instructions. So he's countering that. We could read this opening verse 7 this way. Beloved Christian family, I'm not telling you new things like those who are selling you lies. The things I'm telling you are the good and perpetual commandments of God that have been known since the beginning. That's his emphasis here. Now John is right to refer to the commandments to love or, or he's right to refer to them as old 
because they are old. The great love commands of the Old Testament were the foundational teachings of God for mankind since the beginning. We see this in famous verses like Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might. Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So before moving to see how these things are new, I think it's helpful for us to stop and see that while many of the world are going to try to convince us that there's a better way to do things, God's long-standing commandments on mankind remain the best way to do life and the best way to honor God. And yet, how often, if we're honest, are we guilty of reasoning in our flesh that we have a better way, a different way, a quicker way to do things? So we reject God's truths, His clear instruction, or those He's put over to lead us, and and we look to make our own way. Christian, God's ways are best. God's ways are clear and clearly known. We don't need to pretend we don't know that we are to love God and love others. We definitely don't get to make excuses for why we're not doing this. If I can speak frankly for a moment, when we do this, when we throw off the good and right ways of God to go our own way, we act like immature children who want to act like they didn't know they weren't supposed to curse or cheat or hit their sibling. Right? Like, I didn't know. No, no, you knew. You knew. You know. We all know. And I want this for any of you who are stuck. Stuck in your own ways. I had a beloved brother tell me this week how blessed he's been since he finally owned up to a falsehood that he held on to for far too long. In his pride, in his fear of what might change if he was honest, he he knew what he needed to do. He just doubled down to stay on his stubborn course. Thought he had a better way. But by God's grace, he confessed and forgiveness happened and healing is happening and it's blessing his family. It's blessing his entire life. Church, if you love God, then you obey his commandments and you stop playing around at times like we forget what the right thing was. And we stop being so easily swayed by godless ideas ideas and practices that aim to serve our flesh and our circumstances better than serving and honoring God. Yeah, at those crossroads sometimes, is doing what God calls you to do going to be hard? Yeah. Is it going to cost you something? Yeah. But it's the right thing to do. Because we live for Him. Not, Not for the ease of our days. John says, what I'm telling you is not new like those things invented by false teachers who are promoting man-made ideas and instructions. Church, you've got to be aware. Those people are out there. They're maybe closer to you than you realize. People who want to convince you there's a better way to do this. You don't have to keep going down that course you're on. Being so biblically committed so fervent that that noise is there, that that temptation is there by people you probably love. May we who belong to Him stand on the fact that these good commandments are old, foundational, established. They're grounded in God and therefore they're, they're best. Now, with that cleared up, Context of what looks like it's a little back and forth. Let's look to what is also new. Verse 8. 
At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. John's emphasis that we are to love one another is not new. As we just saw, there are the commandments of God from old, but his reference to them as new is an important reminder for those reading this letter from John of Jesus' authoritative words in John 13. Gospel of John chapter 13, whereby Jesus brought new emphasis to an ancient command to love one another. As now this command is empowered by new life in Christ. In Jesus' establishment of the new covenant, God's redeemed, we the church, are commissioned in a fresh way to live out God's ancient commands to love one another. Jesus focused much of his teachings to refine the way people thought about the moral law of God. Not changing them, but focusing them in light of his presence and his power now at work in his people. For example, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 through 40, the famous place where Jesus brings together the, the great love commands into one great all-encompassing commandment. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. Church, we live to love God and to love others. In whatever way you're not living for these two important priorities, you're not living for God. So while it's not a new commandment, it is a new commandment in the way it's declared by Jesus. Let me read that passage in John 13, verse 34 through 35 to you now. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There are other realities that make this commandment new that are helpful to realize. And so let's take a second and peel those back. First, the aim of the commandment is not all people. The moral law and the great commandment are over all people. Whether you believe in God or not, God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, are upon you. They are the guidelines for life and the way we honor God or the way we prove to be ruled by sin, guilty, deserving His wrath. But this commandment in John 13, as Jesus says this, is for God's chosen people. It is for those who give their lives to Jesus and are saved by Him. It's a commandment given to the church to love one another just as we've experienced the love of God through Jesus Christ. It's Christian love that Jesus wants to be a special beacon of our testimony and kingdom identity while we press on in this temporary time and place. So how is this special to just the church? First, because the love of God is made manifest in a special way in Jesus Christ. God in flesh means love has come near in a special way that the disciples experienced and will continue to experience in their redemption. It's a love that those who deny Jesus are separated from and do not experience. It is a love for one another. Notice this command is to love one another. It's not the love your neighbor or love your enemy instruction that we see elsewhere. It is a call for the love of God to be be made manifest in the life of Christ, to be displayed in the unity and love and the bond of God's redeemed people. Jesus qualifies and clarifies that this love is to be the love that he has shown them. 
It's personal. The love of God made accessible through Jesus and is to be lived out by his people. In this, Jesus gave the commandment to love one another. A new quality, you could say. As now the true disciples of Christ could love others as they've been sacrificially loved by Jesus himself. So sacrificial that that love was unto death. We must know the depth by which we've been loved, church, as the motivation to love others the same way. Romans 5.8, God proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Two verses later, Paul says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. So put those two together. Think about that. While I was a vile sinner, while I was an active enemy of God, Christ died for me. Think about how picky we can be in our flesh as to how, when, or why we love others. But Christ's command on us and example for us is that we love one another sacrificially as Christ loved us. How did Christ love us? John 15, 12 through 14. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, he says. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So do we really love each other this way in the body of Christ? We might understand how maybe a member of the armed forces is trained and committed, ready to lay down their life for a fellow soldier. Solidarity, loyalty, training. But in the church, we fight in a different kind of army. And we're called to a level of love and unity for each other that's like no other. We need to not look to those who serve in armed forces and their sacrificial love to lay down their lives for a fellow soldier as some kind of high bar that we want to attain to. No, the bar is for those who belong to Jesus, who have the love of Jesus. The church is the bar. That means when people think of us, the church, they just think of this kind of sacrificial love. We should be the example. Have you heard of one of our members dying so that another member could live? How quickly would you be guilty of trying to weigh if that was a good decision or not? Oh, but this person had a family, but this person didn't. This person was older, this person was younger, this person was... Whatever we do, the love of Christ in us means that we will love each other to that extent. It's not built on a stack of reasoning. It's it's done because of Christ in us. As we contemplate this, I, I want to remind us that this is a commandment of our Lord, of our Master. We pause all too often at executing this level of love because even though we say our jobs, our stuff, our, our blood families are not as important to us as God is, maybe when it comes down to it, that's not true. Maybe our selfishness still reigns more than our devotion to our Master and His command on our lives. Maybe we're not taking seriously enough the commands of our Lord to love others with sacrificial cost that Jesus has shown us. Let me remind you of God's love and why it is so uniquely different than the world's love. As I read a definition that you're surely aware of, maybe know well, that in all the ways that it feels out of reach, out of touch, it's just because of the height of it as it is the way God defines the way love should be. Love is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Finishing love. Church, true love is selfless and it's sacrificial, which means you will love them when it costs you a lot and it's really hard. The definition of sacrifice is that it costs you something. You are sacrificing something. You give something up. And yet, how often in our flesh are we guilty of going, I don't think I want to do that because I don't really want to give up this thing that I love. Sacrificial love means we love when it's not going our way. We love because Christ loved us, not because of others' performance. How, how, how are you guilty of claiming Christ as Lord and Savior, and yet the way you love others is like the world and not like Jesus? I mean, I really only love you when I get what I want out of the deal. And when I don't, then forget you. So let me ask you, what are you giving up to love others well? It's the true measure of sacrificial love. You think differently and, and you say, I get to sacrifice what I want to love a beloved brother and sister. I get to love like Jesus does. It's the newest addition to our church right there. <laughs> Little Layla Ader. Welcome, baby girl. Church, this is the gospel at work in us as Christians. I take a moment and think of a hard situation that you found yourself in lately. How, how is the sacrificial and selfless love of Christ at work in and through you in this situation? Or are you guilty of standing over here and looking at the situation with a bunch of really fleshly critique or observation or, I don't know, how... This is tough. This is really hard. This is not going the way I really want it. But how is the love of Christ at work in me? And if you're stuck in, in thinking, I really don't want to love sacrificially. I want what I want. And I'm burdened by this command. Then you've got to see that's not the gospel at work in you. That's some outplay of man-made religion. And if this is you, you don't need more devotion. You need more of Christ to capture your heart and propel you forward in His power, not your own. The sacrificial love of God is surely at work in Christ and for those of us who truly belong to Christ. Again, not because of our performance, but because of His. And so back to our verse. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in Him, speaking of Jesus, and in you. Speaking to the beloved, the church, those loved by God. Let's take another second to consider how it's true in Him in some special ways. The, the love of God is true in Christ a couple ways we see this that are good for us. Number one, Jesus takes on flesh and perfectly remains in the Father's love. John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. <clears throat> John 
For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. John 15.10 If you keep my commandments, you will obey, abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Number two, Jesus loves others perfectly. Not only is the love of God perfectly at work in him, but Jesus loves others perfectly. We have so many examples in the scriptures. I don't have time to show you them all. He loves Mary. He loves Martha. He loves Lazarus. He, he, he loves his disciples. He loves his mother. Even his opponents went, went on record noting his love for Lazarus. In John eleven thirty six. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus instructs his disciples to love others in the way that he's modeled for them, modeled loving them. We back to our passage in John 13. I read at the Lord's Supper this morning, read you the opening verses there. A little further down, as I mentioned, verse 12 through 14, Jesus washed their feet. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. For so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. We must understand this posture, this priority for a leader like Jesus to love and serve others in this way to get down on the floor, wash their feet, was unheard of in a Greco-Roman society. In this potent way, his love for others is very new and very revolutionary. Now, while love for others is surely true in Christ, as we've just seen in a quick flyby it's also true of us who belong to him because we are made new in Christ in other words God's love is at work in us because we are in Christ what John has in mind that makes it new is more than a moral directive that's good and right to follow but the actual animation or activity of Christ in us in the new covenant Robert Yarborough theologian author of old speaking of this verse says love has its existence and dynamic not first of all in human ethical expression but in the living Christ Christ in you is why you love others before yourself. Christ in you is how you love others before yourself. Christ is active right now in the lives he's redeemed to bring about his attribute of love into others. The fulfillment of the command to love others, to love one another is true in him and it's true of us who belong to him. It's at work in a new and effective missionary way because we're saved and empowered by Christ. As one theologian says, the newness of the commandment is eschatological. If it's part of the realization of God's promises in the last times. I love what Ian Hamilton once said about Christ's love at work in Christians. Christians are to be a walking advertisement for the gospel. Showing in our love for one another the transforming power of the Spirit of Christ in our lives. Love for Christ and the people of Christ is the distinguishing mark of the new age inaugurated by Christ. 
I'd attempt to say that in a Scottish accent so it could be super cool. But I'm a California boy through and through, I'd butcher it. This is much of John's point in the last part of verse 8. Look at it with me. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him, him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He says, the darkness is passing away. The reference to darkness is one that John made seven times in his gospel, all of them referring to sinful behavior or the realm where sinful behavior runs wild. Later in this letter, he will say in John, 1 John 2.17, the world is passing away along with its desires. Paul had the same proclamation. 1 Corinthians 7.31, the, the present form of this world is passing away. Darkness is the moral or spiritual gloom that enshrouds the fallen human race in this creation. But how is this present age of darkness passing away? Because if we're honest, right, it actually feels like the darkness is only growing in our modern day. What, what helps us cut through that is God's Word, This is a great help to us to understand that it will get worse before it gets better. And as I'd like to remind you many times, sometimes we feel like, man, could this get any worse? There are facets of where the darkness is at work that haven't even caught up yet to how the atrocious wickedness of biblical times. So again, what feels new to us is not new. It's the work of darkness. But what John is referencing here is more in relationship to our gospel reality. When John says the true light is already shining, the true light is Christ. Isaiah 9, 2, people who walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light shone. Matthew 4, 16, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them light has dawned. Quote of that verse. Jesus said to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Luke 1.79 The spiritual reality for all believers in Jesus is great deliverance from our former enslavement in sin and darkness unto life in Christ. Christ has come to ransom us from our slavery to sin and darkness. Said so well, Colossians 1.13, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Galatians 1.3-5, Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The truth is that the darkness is passing away because the true light has begun to shine. John said in the opening words of his gospel, this great mic drop statement, verse 5, John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen? Amen. It's our hope. It's the good news of the gospel. Praise be to God. This this is to be a great and emboldening truth in our lives for those of us who belong to Jesus. Jesus says in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you would have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Is the world raging against God and their sin, against the church and their hatred of Jesus? Yes. Don't be surprised at that. 
But Christ has overcome the world so that we have a true and lasting peace in Him despite what we face. Jesus said, I have come into the world as a light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in the darkness. John 12, 46. Christian, do you cherish the light that has set you free from your dungeon of sin and selfish living? Do you live like you're free? Jesus is clear to say that we'll have trouble in this world, but he's overcome the world. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the key. John 3, 19-21, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. John's reference in our verse to the true light is not as much true versus false, but substance versus shadow. Just as we see referenced in his gospel, John 1.9, it references the true light. In John 6.32, there's reference to the true bread of heaven. In John 15, 1 is reference to the true vine. These good things, light, bread, vine, the source of things that grow, all point to the true, the best, the fulfillment of what makes these things good. Jesus himself. Jesus is the true light who gives life to all who trust in him. Light illuminates our knowledge and understanding. Light reveals truth in a world of lies. It's a blessing. The light of Christ is at work in we who belong to him. It means we won't just come to know God's word. We'll believe in it and we'll put it to work. His light exposes sin. It helps us therefore be able to identify it, confess it, and turn from it. To be accountable with one another. To live out repentance. A.W. Pink says it well. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another of the stars. But all other lights pale before Him who is the light. By God's grace, you might be feeling utter despair lately for stumbling in the darkness of your life. And if you are feeling the conviction of that, stop trying to navigate the darkness by your own power. Because you'll never overcome it. Instead, run to Him who is the light and let Jesus illuminate you to lasting life by His power. Some of you came here today not ever having experienced the true light and life of Jesus. Maybe you've seen that light from a distance. Maybe even come to church or played out what you thought was the Christian life, but in the end, all you were really doing that whole time was standing in the afterglow because you weren't consumed by the light. Today, if this is you, I I pray God gives you eyes to see, ears to hear what he's done on your behalf. That Jesus put on flesh, he lived without sin, he died in the place of guilty sinners, rose again for all who confess their sin and trust their lives to Jesus to be Lord and Savior, are saved, belong to him. This would be good news to you. I pray that you are lit by the life that is Jesus Christ and therefore then repenting of sin and trusting your life to Him. And if you do this, share this with us. We we need to know so we can love you, celebrate with you, and walk with you 
in your new faith. For those of you who are saved by Jesus, we must see how we are now possessors of the light. God calls us to be a lampstand for the light of Christ so that those who are His elect, who are not yet saved, will be saved in their perfect time. We are to love one another and all that God puts in our path for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of many more being ransomed from darkness and into the light, which is Christ, added to our family. While many days you might long to be off this battlefield, what David famously referred to in Psalm 23 as the valley of the shadow of death. But be reminded that today in God's perfect plan and providence, it is not time to take you home. To enjoy Him, to feast and worship Him forever. But He calls us to another day. Because the holy city is not filled yet with His people. Church, we rejoice that heaven is coming, but we are patient because we know it's not yet time. Don't forget Proverbs 14, 4, 18. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Full day is coming, church. Amen? Amen. Holy heaven will be greater than we know how to imagine, but our path for righteous living shows others the light that is Christ. This is the purpose of our days. What are you doing with today? What are you doing with the days He entrusts to you until full day? 1 John 2, 7-8 Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you've heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in Him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, And the true light is already shining. Pray with me. Father, we thank You for this time together in Your Holy Word to to dive deep into these two wonderful verses You've ordained to Holy Scripture that we would know You better. We would be encouraged, challenged, matured. And for some today, maybe even awakened, given saving faith to trust in Jesus and no longer in ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would be at work in the most amazing way. Um, That in light of your grace, Lord, we we are moved, we are motivated to to sing, to celebrate, to testify, to make disciples, to practice the good truths of your word, to to forgive, to, um, to, to care for and serve others sacrificially to remain steadfast, to have that finishing love, Lord, that you showed us. We thank you for your hand at work in us. We thank you the joy it is to serve and worship you in these days you entrust to us. Hear us now as we respond in song. In Jesus' name we pray.